Good morning, everyone. You all hear me? It's always a delight to be with you, to come to Gympie. Um, I'm very familiar with Gympie. I grew up in this district, so it's, it's always good to come back and to share in, both in class and also in the service of worship. <clears throat> so this morning, I want to invite you to turn to that passage that was read to us uh, from Acts chapter 11, starting at verse 19. <clears throat> My text is found in verse 22 of that passage. And there we read, the news about this reached the church in Jerusalem. So they sent Barnabas to Antioch. <clears throat> now what I'd like to do this morning is to profile one of the unsung heroes of the New Testament. His name is Barnabas. So I want to look at some passages in the book of Acts where Barnabas is mentioned and see if we can discover what sort of man he was. The first mention of him is in Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37, where Luke introduces him. And we read there, Joseph, a Levite born in Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means one who encourages, sold some land he owned, brought the money, and handed it over to the apostles. Even in this brief passage, two facets of his character are clearly sketched. His given name was Joseph, <clears throat> but he was nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. I wonder how he got that nickname. The second facet is his generosity. He was apparently quite wealthy. Luke tells us that at a time when many of the believers in Jerusalem were voluntarily selling their properties and putting the proceeds into a common fund, Barnabas also sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. This money was used in helping the needy. Now, by introducing him in this way, Luke foreshadows the part he would later play in the missionary outreach of the early church. When Saul of Tarsus arrived back in Jerusalem after his conversion to the Christian faith on the Damascus Road, he found himself regarded with the utmost suspicion and distrust. And, I mean, it's not surprising that that was the case. <clears throat> it was in that very city that he had made havoc of the church and had dragged men and women off to prison because of their newfound Christian faith. Now, <clears throat> Luke has already shown how, at crucial moments in Saul's career, key people had a part in drawing him to Christ and his church. The, Christian, the first Christian martyr, Stephen, his final prayer had a profound impact on Saul. And we read at the end of chapter 7 of Acts, <clears throat> the witnesses to Stephen's death laid their cloaks or left their cloaks in the care of a young man named Saul. They kept on stoning Stephen as he called out to the Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried in a loud voice, Lord, do not remember this sin against them. Saul of Tarsus never forgot that day. It had a profound impact upon him. The church also owes Saul to the generous spirit of one Ananias. It was Ananias who, at the Lord's behest, came to Saul soon after his Damascus Road experience, placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul. Imagine saying that, by the way, to somebody who had ravaged the church, was relentless in his persecution. Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. Later, in Acts chapter 9, we see the large-hearted concern of Barnabas. 
No one else in Jerusalem, Christian or Jew, wanted to go anywhere near Saul. But Barnabas stood by him. Luke writes in Acts 9 verse 27, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Now, in doing this, Barnabas showed that he was ready to believe the best about Saul. When others suspected Saul of being a spy or someone secretly hired to join the Jerusalem believers to incite them to do something that would expose them to punishment by the Jews, Barnabas insisted on believing that he was genuine. Barnabas was not someone to hold a person's past against them. And it's safe to say, I think, that without Barnabas, Saul would have been left permanently out in the cold. <clears throat> now, in Acts 11, verses 19 to 26, the passage that was read to us, Luke records the founding of the church in Antioch, a church consisting mostly of Gentiles or non-Jews. Antioch was in northern Syria, close to the northeastern corner of the Mediterranean Sea. <clears throat> News of this Gentile response to the gospel reached the apostles in Jerusalem. The church at Jerusalem wanted to keep this development under close watch, under close scrutiny, so Barnabas was sent to investigate, and he was an excellent choice for the task. According to one commentator, they sent the man with the biggest heart in the church. In verse 24 of that passage, Luke describes him as a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Though his home church in Jerusalem was undoubtedly very different in style, Barnabas was no wet blanket, but enthusiastically encouraged the young movement. And Luke says in verse 23, when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. But Barnabas knew that the work in Antioch would soon get too big for him to handle alone. He also knew <clears throat> that the work required a man whose background was broader than his own, someone of Jewish ancestry and training, but also well-skilled in cross-cultural communication and free of racial prejudice to be able to relate to Gentiles or non-Jews. And he knew where to find just the right man for the job. So he went to Tarsus, Paul's hometown, or Saul's hometown, found Saul and brought him back to Antioch. And for a whole year, they had a fruitful ministry together. In graciously moving Saul to the forefront of the stage, Barnabas showed profound wisdom and true missionary statesmanship. This self-effacing quality in Barnabas is seen even more clearly in Acts chapter 13, two chapters further on. In the early verses, Barnabas is named ahead of Saul. At Antioch, we read that Barnabas and Saul are set apart for the mission to the Gentiles. In verse 7 of that chapter, during their first missionary journey, Sergius Paulus, the proconsul of Cyprus, sends for Barnabas and Saul in order to hear the word of God. But in verse 13 of that same chapter, Luke refers to Paul and his companions. John Mark was with, with them also, though he left them soon after and returned to Jerusalem. So as their missionary journey progressed, Paul clearly assumed the leadership role and Barnabas was content to have it that way. He was self-effacing, happy to play second fiddle to ensure that God's work would get done. 
Now, I've never been a member of an orchestra, but I'm told that playing second fiddle is one of the hardest jobs for a person because every musical um, exponent wants to showcase his talents uh, and be the lead. But Barnabas was content to play second fiddle, to sort of retire to the background and let others uh, be prominent. Now, friends, it's always sad when Christians have a disagreement, especially when it's between two people who had worked so closely together as Paul and Barnabas had. <clears throat> but Luke records in Acts chapter 15 that at the outset of a proposed second missionary tour, the two of them had a disagreement. They disagreed so strongly over whether to take John Mark with them again. And the disagreement was so intense and so sharp that they parted company. The upshot of it was that Barnabas took Mark, Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus, while Paul chose Silas to accompany him on his second missionary journey. You can read all about that in Acts chapter 15, verses 36 to 40. I, I won't go there now. Now, we're not told why Mark left them during the first missionary journey. Perhaps he resented seeing Paul take the lead with his cousin Barnabas slipping into second place. Perhaps the prospect of a difficult and dangerous journey up onto the plateau in Central Asia Minor frightened him. Perhaps he was just plain homesick. We, we don't know. We can only speculate. But whatever the reason, Paul found it unacceptable and considered him unfit to travel with them again. Barnabas, however wanted to give Mark another chance, and they couldn't reach agreement. Now, I guess you're wondering, who was right? Probably both were right, up to a point. Paul was a very astute judge of character and discerned that Mark was not yet suited to the stresses and strains of another missionary journey. Barnabas, on the other hand, was prepared to overlook one lapse in the hope of a stronger character yet to emerge. Whatever the case, whoever was right, one thing is certain. Mark was extremely fortunate to have a friend like Barnabas. It was probably the friendship and encouragement of Barnabas, the man who wanted to allow a second chance, that enabled Mark to regain his self-respect and made him determined to rise above his past failure. Friends, we always ought to be grateful for those who have offered us a second chance after the mistakes that we've made with our lives. And we also ought to be very thankful to the Lord Jesus who longs to give us a second chance to turn toward him. Happily, Mark did redeem himself in Paul's estimation. A few years later, we read that Mark was with Paul during the Apostle's first imprisonment. There are a couple of mentions of Mark in Colossians 4, verse 10, and also in that little letter at the back of the New Testament, the letter of Philemon, verse 24. <clears throat> in Colossians 4, verse 10, Paul includes Mark among his fellow workers who had been a comfort to him. And in his final letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, verse 11, Paul writes... Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Because of Barnabas, Mark's failure was not final. He was able to hold his head high again. And to Mark, we are indebted for the first gospel account to be written. He is the saint who first found grace to pen the life that was the light of of men. Friends, what a debt of gratitude we owe to Barnabas, this unsung hero of the New Testament, this encourager who knew how to bring out the best in others, this unassuming man who was content to play second fiddle. The Christian counsellor Larry Crabb <clears throat> tells how, as a youngster, he had a problem with stuttering. 
which he found thoroughly annoying and humiliating. In the ninth grade, he was elected president of the junior high student body. At the induction ceremony, he was beckoned by the principal to join him on stage in front of his fellow students, several hundred of them. Here is his description of what followed. Standing nervously in front of the squirming, bored crowd, I was told to repeat after the principal the words, I, Larry Crabb, of Plymouth White Marsh Junior High School, do hereby promise, dot, dot, dot. That's how the principal said it. My version was a bit different. I, L -l 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 Larry Crabb of P -p 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 Plymouth White Marsh Junior High School, do P -p 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 promise. The principal was sympathetically perplexed. My favorite English teacher wanted to cry. A few students laughed out loud. Most were awkwardly amused and some felt bad for me. And I died a thousand deaths. I decided right then that public speaking was not for me. <clears throat> a short time later, our church celebrated the Lord's Supper in a Sunday morning worship service. It was the custom in our congregation to encourage young men to enter into the privilege of worship by standing and praying aloud. That particular Sunday, I responded by unsteadily leaving my chair for the first time with the intention of praying. Filled less with worship than with nervousness, I found my theology becoming confused to the point of heresy. Stuttering throughout, I finally thought of the word Amen, perhaps the first evidence of the Spirit's leading. I said it and I sat down. I recall staring at the floor, too embarrassed to look around and solemnly vowing never again to pray or speak aloud in front of a group. Two strikes were enough. When the service was over, I darted toward the door, but I wasn't quick enough. An older Christian man named Jim Dunbar intercepted me, put his arm across my shoulder and cleared his throat to speak. Larry, he said, there's one thing I want you to know. Whatever you do for the Lord, I'm behind you 100%. And then he walked away. Those words were life words. They had power. They reached deep into my being. My resolve never again to speak publicly weakened instantly. Since the day those words were spoken, God has led me into a ministry in which I regularly address and pray before crowds of all sizes, and I do it without stuttering. Now, friends, all of this prompts me to ask a couple of questions before I conclude this morning. Question number one. Is there someone you know who is or was a Barnabas or a Jim Dunbar to you? If so, give thanks to God for him or her. And if possible, be sure to tell that person how much you appreciate and value his or her ministry. The power of encouragement. Question number two. Is there someone within your circle of influence to whom you can be a Barnabas or a Jim Dunbar? Friends, never let us forget or overlook the enormous power of encouragement. Friends, we all need it and so do our fellow believers in Christ. This world is no friend to grace. The writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 10 verse 23, Friends, let us hold fast to the hope we profess without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to spur one another on to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, 
as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your servant Barnabas. We thank you for the power of encouragement. And we ask, O oh God, that you will help us to be genuinely appreciative of those who have helped us along the way, who have spoken a word in season when we were weary and in need of a word of comfort. And we pray too, O oh God, that you will help us to be encouragers of those who cross our paths. Help us to be discerning enough to sense their need and to be ready to speak a word of comfort in season. And we ask, O oh God, that you will help us to be an encouragement to each other, to one another, as we travel this pilgrim journey together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.